Hello, hello, and welcome to the V Brown Bag U.S. edition for, uh, you know what, I, f I forgot the date, but March something. Um, but tonight, we're actually going to be, uh, tonight we've got Matt Oswald on the line, and he's going to be talking about continuous integration for networks, right? So we're going to be basically talking that DevOps mentality, but applying it to the networking piece of things. Um with that being said, I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of quick notes here. Um, so obviously get into the conversation. You can follow us at vbrownbag.com. You can also for, uh, put questions uh, to the Twitter hashtag uh, vbrownbag. So hashtag vbrownbag. Please remember, you know, we are, um, you know, we're global at this point. We've got, uh, we've got shows in APAC, EMEA, the U.S. We're just kind of all over the place. So, you know, no matter where you are, there's there's some V Brown bags being put out there and community feeding content. And so definitely get involved. Um, and as I said, we've got Matt on the line and I'm John Harris. I'm your host tonight. And Matt, do you want to kind of give us a summary of what you're going to be going over tonight? Sure thing. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, thanks, John. My or my name is uh, Matt Oswalt. As uh, he said, I'm uh, I started my career uh, as a software developer for a large retail company. Um, did a lot of work with um, basically developing applications for a voice over IP system that they purchased. Uh, moved out of that into consulting, uh, actually for network and data center infrastructure for about four years. Uh, due, and that was mostly due to the fact that as a you know somebody on the voice over IP team, I sort of had my eye on the network team every once in a while. I was like, oh, that's interesting, you know, what they're working on. So I got into that. Uh, but after about four years, I'm back. I'm now uh, doing you know, software development pretty much exclusively now. Um, and right now, my current obsession is you know, bridging the gap between the two silos, basically. So um, that is my background. And uh, before I get started, you know, to obviously feel free to ask questions at any time. You know, I'll be covering a lot of different topics, and I don't want to move past anything you know, too quickly, especially if it could use a little more detail. Okay. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter there, Matt. And right. uh let you take the reins and run with it. All righty. Can everybody see what's on? Yes, I can see your. Uh, we can see your screen there, Matt. Cool. Okay, so yeah, uh, there's my Twitter handle, blog. If you guys are so inclined to read that kind of stuff, I blog mostly about uh, networking topics, but with a focus on, well, these days with a focus on uh, software development, uh, DevOps. Uh, workflows, continuous integration, test-driven development. That's my sort of latest kick whenever I do get a chance to write. So uh, just a quick disclaimer on what I'll be covering. In short, I work, uh, and this is not that. Uh, so uh, the network challenges today, um, there's many of them. Um, but I'd like to just sort of, uh, I, I wrote these down sort of off the top of my head. What is, if, you know, what, would, what, what, is, what is a challenge to network operators and administrators these days? Um, whether they know it or not, basically the, 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 the top of this list is that manual changes inevitably lead to something that uh, we lovingly call config drift. Now config drift um, could be between two employees, um, could be between an employee and some software, or could actually be between two software elements, but basically what, it's, what config drift means is uh, a gap between the idea of what it should be and what it really is. Um, those acronyms, uh, WISB and WIRI, W-I-S-B, W-I-R-I. Somebody introduced those to me recently, and I thought it was genius, so I had to share it with you guys. But basically, config drift is the gap between those two things, what it should be and what it really is. And right now, uh, you know, whenever we change anything manually, and this is true outside of just network infrastructure, what we're doing is we're deviating in some way from those two things because it's impossible for human beings to communicate everything perfectly. Uh, there needs to be some sort of automated process, whether it's automating the documentation of a change, automating the change itself, whatever it is, there needs to be some sort of coordination between those two. Keeping those two things in very tight sync is important. Uh, so, and then uh, as you scale your network, um, you increase the chance uh, and actually the severity of a problem that might surface. So not only will the problems happen, it's, it's more likely for problems to surface. Uh, the, the problem, the scope, uh, or as, as a friend of mine lovingly refers to it as the blast radius of a problem, uh, those all increase as you scale your network. Um, uh, if you look at how the web scale and hyperscale companies do network configuration, I'm really talking about like the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. Um, you know, they rarely touch any network device directly. They've all come out publicly with how they're doing things, and none of it includes, you know, we log into this top of rack switch and make this change. That's that's a, that's a no-no in those kind of shops. And this isn't 
just because of scale. That's a part of it, but that's not the only reason. It's really, when you come down to it, it's a matter of discipline, uh, which applies to smaller shops, not just you know the, the hyperscale companies. Uh, the third point is specific. If you've ever run, run a network, uh, it's more than likely that you've heard of the tool uh, Rancid. And uh, in short, Rancid is a way to essentially back up your network configurations and then provide some sort of version control on those backups so that you can see, you know, for instance, hour over hour what's changed. Uh, but this is really just, you know, that backup uh, at the end of the workflow with a little bit of version control. Um, it's at the tail end of your workflow. Uh, so you've made a you know network change and then and then Rancid copies the full config down and tells you what's changed. That's uh, that's at the very tail end of your workflow. What we'll be discussing today is more um, doing doing version control at the very beginning of your workflow. In fact, only allowing the change to to continue um, only after certain requirements have been met in an automated way. So I've been writing about this topic for the last couple you know months or weeks or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, buzzword bingo. If anybody's playing, uh, hope you've hope you've won because uh, I've thrown a, certainly a few out there. But in short, there's there's just a there's a there's a, a few ideas that are that are specific to using the ideas behind DevOps in a networking infrastructure context. Um, and frankly, the business benefit is the same, uh, no matter which way you look at it. There really is no network specific DevOps. There is um, th there is the one objective of pushing more work through the pipeline safely. Um, we're all, you know, we're all in this together. We're all one big happy family. Network is just another resource to consume. So there's no reason it should be a separate entity. It should be treated the same way. Uh, and I, I don't think I'll be addressing too, uh, you know, everything in its entirety. I certainly won't be going down the rabbit hole for every single one. But there will be a few ideas covered in this in this demo. Hey Matt, I I, yeah. I see a word missing. Desired state. Desired state. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm just messing. Okay, yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yes, it's we'll we'll say it's implied for now. <laughs> okay, uh, so community is growing. The community is growing. Uh, what I mean by this is that I'm not the only one doing this. This is not just mine. In fact, I can't even claim credit for most of these ideas. Um, what, what I'm doing here is sort of showing you all what is possible. Um, and by what is possible, I mean what I see making it in production um, from other people that are doing this uh, in the community. Uh, these ideas are being hashed out and tested as we speak. Um, and, and I'm not talking about you know, necessarily one specific vendor. I'm talking from a methodology perspective. The independent community is coming to this, coming to this consensus as a whole. Um, you know, so is this a reality for you know, the majority of companies today? No. Uh, but the 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 culture behind this and the workflow behind this is, there's there's validity to it and we're finding out more and more that these things can be done safely it's not just about doing cool stuff on our networks it's actually making our networks more resilient more responsive to change and things like that uh, one slide that I that I would love to go through right now um, first off I would be remiss if I didn't talk about culture and I know this is sort of something that gets addressed you know, all the time but let me Sort of make this, you know, connect the dots from the network perspective. You know, culture is key. Um, the buy-in from the leadership is absolutely is absolutely crucial. You can't do any of this, um, and frankly, you shouldn't do any of this if you don't have that buy-in. There's really not much point in embarking on the network automation journey uh, if you're unable to get buy-in. Uh, so, to that end, uh, I would recommend start simple. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of things uh, today that you probably shouldn't just go do on your network tomorrow. Um, but I would highly advise that you at least implement similar workflows. Um, the examples that that uh, that come up uh, often are things like automating the change of like host names uh, for your network devices or SNMP community strings, things like that. Things that aren't super crucial for the operation of the network, but are still changes. Um, what that allows you to do is get the workflow nailed down um, by not touching anything that might impact production while you sort it all out. Um, so once that's stable, you can start you know adding in more advanced stuff like changing routing protocols and things of that nature. Uh, and then uh, I just want to throw a shout out. Tyler Christensen, uh, he's a really brilliant dude. Uh, been working uh, in the network automation space for a decent amount of years uh, now. So he's he's actually done this in production. He just uh, did a network automation uh, presentation at a, at a meetup at Cumulus. Um, I will, uh, there's a link to a blog post that he published. I don't know if it made it into my slide deck, but um, if you guys, you know, stay tuned for the blog post that comes out after this, I'll be sure to embed a link there. Highly recommend you look at it. It's sort of a, you know, a very similar workflow to mine. I know that he goes way beyond what I do because uh, he's a lot more experienced with Junos than I am. So definitely recommend you guys uh, check that out. It's, it's a really good read.
So Matt, um, we actually did get a we got a question here in the question panel. Um, Grant okay. Mitchell was kind of and and you may be getting to this later, but we'll go ahead and throw it out there. His question was, you know, in this um, you know this automated manner where you're changing configs and things like that. How do you handle change management and documenting it? Because in a lot of organizations, you know, that, that may be a requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that will definitely be covered um, in the in the demo and probably in the next slide or two. I'll show you how I'm doing that. Um, okay. The way, um, this is basically the pipeline that I've devised is, is not really something that I've devised. I've modeled it very simply after the way that Open source software projects, uh, some of the bigger ones, I, I did some work on the Open Daylight project. Uh, OpenStack does it the same way. Basically, uh, the integration between uh, the various tools that allow them to push changes to the code base uh, that are documented, there's an approval process in place, all of that's included in this. Okay, awesome. So uh, that's enough, you know, uh, that's enough fluff, if you will. Uh, I'd like to talk about the tools that I'm using. Um, just a brief overview. Um, a lot of these I think everybody should at least know of. Um, if you don't, obviously there's tons of resources on all these. I picked all of these because they're very well documented, very very widely used. So they're not, you know, none of these tools are some corner, uh, you know, corner project that, that that nobody's ever heard of. These are very popular tools. Uh, so Git. Git is um, a version control system um, that's uh, invented by Linus Torvalds. He, uh, you know. This was one of his, as he calls it, his two achievements. And I'm guessing everybody knows the other one. Uh, basically, Git is, you know, version control software. If you've ever used like Subversion or CVS, this is sort of, kind of, sort of the same thing. I, I, you know, I don't want to get into religious debate. I love Git. Um, there are similarities, and there are definitely differences with other systems. Um, you know, so it doesn't have to be Git, but I'll be using Git in this workflow because it's um, obviously very well supported, very well understood uh, at large. However. It is, it is somewhat difficult to learn if you get into the advanced topics. Um, so if you're, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to pick up Git, I highly recommend you do it. I love it. I think it's a great tool to have in your tool belt. Just understand if you really, really want to know it, it doesn't take, you know, a mere 24 hours. There's a lot to Git. The stuff that we're going to be doing in this presentation is probably not super advanced. We're going to be doing basic stuff um, that, and I take the, I take the approach. This is, this is something that a non-programmer can pick up. Um, all of these tools are used in software development, but that doesn't mean you need to know source code. That doesn't mean you need to know Python or Java or anything like that. Uh, it's really all about the methodologies uh, and the workflow, and not so much the tools and the languages. So that's Git. Uh, Garrett uh, is a, uh, I guess it's called basically a, a, a code review software. A version, you know, ver version control is done by Git, so it operates on top of Git. Uh, so the Garrett software itself is basically a review uh, process. And what it does is it basically allows humans and robots, uh, and I say robots, I'm basically, you know, uh, um, service accounts, we'll call them, uh, to provide feedback on changes. So let's say a software developer pushes a patch into a code base. You could have a human being look at the code that's been, that's been changed, provide feedback in terms of a comment or a plus one, negative one, whatever. Robots or service accounts could do the same thing. So the next tool we're going to be talking about, which is Jenkins, can actually go back into Garrett and say, hey, I've done some sort of test on this, on this change that you've made, and it passed, so I'm going to give you an automated plus one. So what that allows the human being to do, let's say there's somebody on top of the project that sort of uh, manages it and, and, and makes sure that all the code is properly reviewed from a human perspective, seeing that plus one from Jenkins allows them to have confidence that it actually passes, at the very least, basic tests and isn't you know, totally wrong. Now, um, this is one of the more interchangeable pieces of the entire workflow. Uh, Garrett, if you've ever worked with it, you know it can be kind of finicky. So another valid approach is to use Garrett, or to, uh, instead of use Garrett, you could use something like uh, you know, GitHub Enterprise or, frankly, GitHub Public. You could use that too. Um, GitLab, Bitbucket, um, a lot of those, those work just fine. Uh, as long as you're not married to Garrett's uh, you know, approval process. Garrett's approval process is pretty unique. It doesn't use pull requests like GitHub does. It's, it's sort of... Um, it's sort of just, you know, a strict review, a patch set kind of thing, uh, and then it gets into the code base. So as long as you're not married to that, you know, you can substitute it out with something else. Uh, Jenkins is sort of a build automation Swiss Army knife. Uh, if there is a main use case for Jenkins, which I don't think there is, but I know it's commonly used to build Java Maven projects. Uh, that's sort of an option that's sort of built into to Jenkins, so you can do that. But uh, the main use case, and all, what I've used it for, is to create something called freestyle projects, which is essentially just do whatever you want. So Jenkins, can, you can build a freestyle project to react to changes in Garrett and do whatever you want to those changes. 
Um, what we'll be doing is pulling down those changes and running certain scripts against them to make sure that they're valid. Uh, but you could you could do anything you want. In fact, there's several options in there for you to run, um, you know, Python scripts, Bash scripts, anything you want. Uh, so it's really that's why I call it the Swiss Army knife. You can do whatever you want. It's like a workflow engine. Uh, so the last tool that I'd like to cover, and I and I know I don't have to spend a lot of time on this because I know it's been covered in this in this uh, series, Ansible. Um, in in short, if you don't if you're if you're not aware of it, it's simple, easy configuration management. Uh, we're going to be using this to build the templates for our network configuration. We're also going to use Ansible to deploy the configuration to our routers uh, via some of the modules that Juniper has uh, contributed to the Ansible project. Um, so I'm going to assume you have a basic understanding of how Ansible works, uh, but the way that we'll be using it is kind of unique just because the modules are probably relatively new. Okay, uh, any questions up until now? Um, I've been monitoring the streams and um, I'm not seeing any currently, Matt. Okay. Well, I'll move forward then uh, to the actual fun part, which is showing you how this actually works. Enough of me talking. Uh, so, uh, for what it's worth, I used this entire pipeline to create the uh, JunoS lab. Uh, so I, um, I have a, a, a demo topology, which I can show you in a second. But basically, this entire pipeline I used to create this. So there's a lot of files involved with that, which I'll go into in a second. And uh, I'll be pushing these all to GitHub for you guys to download offline. Um, and I highly recommend that you set up uh, you know, a similar lab and, and, and you know, try some of these ideas out uh, in, in like a virtual environment. That'd be, that'd be a, a great way to learn. Uh, so let's see. Let's go over first off. Let's go over some of the some of the tools that I just went over. First of all, Garrett. So Garrett, this is the this is the review software. And in essence, whenever I push code or um, not even let's let's not call it code. Let's call it configuration artifacts because it's what we'll be pushing is mostly like XML and uh, YAML files. Uh, but it's a it, it's you know a repository. Here's the command that you want to run if you wanted to clone it and uh, you know do some do some stuff with it. Uh, in fact, you can look at uh, my changes. I'm logged in as me. Uh, you can look at some of the changes that I made. This is the change that I made to revert back to the state that it needs to be in um, for this demo, as an example. And we're going to see all of the different changes uh, pop up there as we make them. There's really not a lot to Garrett. Um, in fact, the better way of looking at Garrett and getting a proper tour is in action, because that's when we'll be able to do all the approvals and things like that. So I'm going to go on to Jenkins. Jenkins um, is actually a lot easier um, than I thought it was going to be. Uh, before I ever got into Jenkins, I assumed it was this complicated, you know, mess because all I'd seen of it was these huge software projects where there were, you know, basically hundreds of of, of jobs, and I just it was a huge complication. But it, it actually is not. Um, spending a little bit of time with it proves that it's it's really not that complicated to get into. Uh, so what I'd like to do is introduce you to the two that are relevant to this discussion. And the two jobs that I've set up is CI Networks uh, hyphen test hyphen geo. Geo is the name of the Garrett server. Uh, and CI Networks run geo. Test geo is set up to test haha, uh, the changes that we make so that when we push a patch, we know with reasonable certainty that it should work in, in at least a basic way. Uh, and we'll get to the details of that later. CI Networks run hyphen geo is the, uh, is the job that actually pushes the configuration to the routers. Uh, and we'll, uh, again, we'll get into that in more detail when we get to that point. But I just wanted to introduce you to the, to the components of this. Okay, uh, back to here for a visual. This is our demo topology. So um, if you are inclined to screenshot, I highly recommend you do that now. Uh, I might tab back to this every once in a while, but it's super helpful, I'm sure, uh, if you have this handy uh, so that you're not lost when I'm referring to the different routers and the different loopback address, IP addresses and all those things. So I would recommend you do that now. Okay, uh, moving on to the demo outline. So I'm sort of treated this like a, like a certification exam. Uh, it, no worries if we don't get through all of this. Please, again, if, you, if I go too fast for something, it's no harm if, if I uh, don't make one of these objectives. It's not like it's an actual exam. So these are just guidelines on, on things that we can do. But the idea is uh, we've got three VSRX instances, and if you're not familiar with those, those are just virtual routers slash firewalls from Juniper. Uh, so all this lab is, is in uh, a hypervisor. Uh, they're running uh, BGP, 
uh, the, the routing protocol, and all of the neighbor relationships are up, but we're not advertising any networks. What we need to do is threefold. We need to be able to advertise the loopback address on VSRX03. So we need to be able to inform VSRX01 and 02 about this network. It's not directly connected to them, so it doesn't know about those. We want BGP to instruct them on how to reach that network. Uh, we need to ensure that VSRX01 sees at least this one route, and that's this router. We want to make sure that this network over here, 1231231233, is visible by VSRX01. And that seems easy, but we actually want to do that in an automated fashion. We actually want an error to pop up if we don't see that. And we'll get into how that's possible. We want also, lastly, we, want, we need VSRX01 to prefer the path through VSRX02. This is the part where it absolutely does not is not super necessary if we get to that because that's using a, a pretty, uh, it's, it's using a feature of BGP that not everybody may be familiar with, but it's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely there for us if we, if we so, are so inclined. So, any questions on the demo, the lab setup? I am not seeing any questions coming through at the, at the current moment, Matt. Okay, cool. All right. So that's enough of the slide deck for a while. Let's get into the routers and see what's going on. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm actually a Junos noob. I've done a lot of Cisco and a little Arista um, for a long time, uh, so I'm still still learning. But uh, obviously, if you if you know Junos, there's plenty plenty that you can do beyond this demo. Um, the one thing that I will do is show that the neighbor relationships are up. If we can do BGP sum, you can see that the neighbor relationships between VSRX01 and the two routers are up, so they can see each other. And if we do uh, to show the routing table, we can see that the 1231231233 network is not visible. So that's over here on VSRX03, and it looks like my SSH session froze. But basically, that network uh, is not being advertised, which is expected. So now that we've done that, I'd like to show you the main portion of this, which is uh, the environment we're going to be working with. This is the directory uh, that I showed you in Garrett. This is the Git repository. Uh, called CI-networks. We're going to be working with a few files in here. Let me get some of this clutter out of the way. Uh, we're going to be working with a few files in here. Uh, the main Ansible playbook that we're going to be using is main.yml. So just a quick tour of this. Uh, do some basic fact gathering. Uh, shows us things like you know serial number and, and version of software that's running on each router. Uh, we're also creating uh, build directories for each host. That's actually this build directory up here. We're going to be building templates of the routers based off of the roles that we want them to have. So, for instance, we want these routers to run OSPF and BGP. Uh, we want to uh, push those config files into the routers, uh, this role, and then the OSPF role, and the BGP role. Uh, and then, uh, and that's it. So, we, that basically, this, this playbook takes us from supposedly nothing, or at least a very bare-bones configuration, to running BGP the way that we think it should be run. And this, the, all these files are in the Git repository, so any change to any file in here is, is considered uh, you know, a change to the overall uh, image. The idea is that we want to be able to configure all of those things that we had in the objectives, but not touch any of the CLIs specifically, unless we're doing like show commands. But in, in terms of making changes, we don't want to go directly to the CLI. We want to do all those changes from this directory and, and pushing those changes up to Garrett. That's the objective. Uh, uh, I also have another playbook here, build.yml. It's, it's essentially a stripped-down version of main.yml, uh, and I'll show you why I've done this here in a little bit, but in short, it just builds the templates. It renders the templates based off of the variables that we have set up in our, in our YAML files. Uh, like I said, I'll show you why that's, why that's important. It's, a, it's an important step that we need to take. It's sort of a verification that we've done everything the right way. So. Let's take a look at what got us to this point. As I said, I built this entire lab using the same workflow. So I didn't just build these files in a bare bones way and go into the CLI and you know hack away at the CLI to get to get the topology that I wanted. I actually made those changes using this same workflow. As you can see, there was plenty of changes in Garrett before we got into it. So I'm going to take you to those those specific files. We're not gonna, like I said, we're not going to be touching everything. Uh, but we will we will uh, touch what we, what's necessary to make the changes that we need. Specifically, this bgp.xml file, um, the BGP configuration that we need is defined in XML. This is a Juno S XML configuration file, 
And as you can see, we've created uh, little Jinja2 snippets inside of this file. You, you, I'm sure you guys know uh, at least of Jinja2 based off of the Ansible experience. This is exactly the same thing. So what we're doing is we're actually rendering an XML file uh, from this Jinja2 template, which ends up in this build directory. So if you remember the playbook, the playbook that we looked at before, you'll remember that it renders from this template to this build directory. So from this template, we get this XML file. And yeah, the tags are mixed up a little bit. I need to fix that, but it still works. Um, JunoS is, is knowledgeable enough to figure that out. And this essentially just sets us up with the BGP neighbors. Pretty simple. So now the trick is to make changes to this to get what we want. We want to be able to advertise that network that's not being advertised right now. And that network exists on VSRX03. So let's take a look at VSRX03. This is the YML file that defines all of the information that we need uh, to configure that specific router. You might have noticed we only have one template for all of the routers. You know, there is no bgp.xml just for VSRX03 or VSRX02. There's just a single template. We differentiate between those templates, or between the instances that are rendered from those templates, by passing in variables from these YAML files. So what we want to do, and I usually start this way because typically nothing's been written at this point. The way that I usually look at it is, how would I want to write this YAML file? Because it's totally up to me. There's no rule that says you have to do it one way or the other because I haven't built the part of the template where that uses this information yet. So there's plenty of ways that you can do this. I'm, gonna be, I'm, I'm just going to keep it simple. And I'm going to add another tag underneath this dictionary. So it'll be bgp.advertise. That's another key on that dictionary. If I tab ahead and add a, a list here of networks to advertise, I can just simply put that subnet in there, uh, or rather the IP address that belongs to that network that's being advertised, uh, that interface. Uh, and what that allows me to do is create a dictionary with uh, a value of a list. And then, yeah, that list only has one network in it, but that's okay. We can still loop through it once. So that's, uh, that's what we've got. Uh, and we also, uh, we need to change our template as well. So now that we have the information in our YAML file, the network that we want to advertise, and again, only on VSRX03, we don't need to change the other ones because they don't have this network. Now we can go into here our bgp.xml file, and we can make a few changes. Now, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to copy in a huge block of text, because there's a huge block of text, and it's not going to benefit anybody for me to type in it manually. But in short, this block of text that I'm going to copy in is the XML output for configuring the uh, advertisement of this network. This is what you would get on a Juno S box if you were to just manually configure it. So that's all well and good, but we need to templatize this because it, it doesn't serve us or anybody to have anything statically referred to. So that's cool. Let's make this a template. Let's actually add the same logic that we have up here with these for loops and with the if statements, the conditionals. Let's do the same thing for this block that we've added below. First off, if you'll notice, I have blocks in here that say uh, only run this text, only render this part of the template if the BGP key is defined. That's important because the BGP key is not defined on anything other than VSRX03. So if we were to not have that in there and it tries to render it on VSRX02, for instance, it would error out. So let's actually add that down here as well. Uh, and what did our key say? If BGP.advertised or advertise is defined. So again, same logic applies. Only run this bottom block of text if that particular key exists. And of course, we need to end that as well. So let's put that down there. Oops, didn't mean to do that. OK, uh, and then finally, uh, what we need to do is loop through all of the networks that we have. So we've referred to this key. We also need to actually put this network in there. So that's a list. Yes, it only has one item, but we can still loop through it. And we'll end that. And what this does is it allows us to simply say, instead of statically referring to it, prefix. Okay. That's probably the most tedious part of this entire thing. 
So what we've done here, just to recap, is we've we've put we've put we've we've taken something that we know works or that I know works, <laughs> uh, and essentially we we've gone through and we've created a template out of some, out of something that already is is known to work. Uh, and actually, we need to do the same thing for uh, this section down here. I need to I'll I'll, I'll uh, fill you guys in on exactly what this section does, uh, but it's it's similar. So yeah, again, we've we've taken something that we know works. This is this is a way that you know typical network administrators, non-developers, can get started making templates, taking network configurations that are known to work. They can take them right off of the routers that that are in production, and create a template out of it, rendering those template in, those templates in real time to something that you know uh, that, that from something that you know works is the, is one of the easiest ways to just start explore the idea of templatizing your configurations. So let's go back to the command line here. Let's run Ansible Playbook, and we're going to say build.yml. And again, that build playbook is aimed at uh, building the template but not doing anything else with it. So this allows us to see if we've actually built our template correctly. And no errors, so it looks like we did. Uh, and by the way, the hosts argument here, um, I have a host file in this directory that just basically lists all of the, the VSRX instances in our lab. So there's nothing special about that. So what did it do? The best way to verify is to actually just go to the XML uh, script that we that we generated and see that yes, indeed, it actually does have uh, BGP network these policy statements. It also has um, the neighbors here. It is missing one piece though, and I'm glad I caught that. And this is exactly why you run the build before you push because you catch these things. But the missing piece is this little snippet, and just for the sake of being brief, I'll I'll go ahead and just copy and paste this again. Uh, what this particular snippet does is actually refer to the policy that we just set up. Uh, so let's take this out for the time being and I'll say uh, BGP network. So this policy is down here. So this policy that we defined, I'm referring to it here. Okay. So I'm done with that. Now let's go back to the command line and check out what has changed. So we can see that the vsrx03.yml file has changed. We can also see that bgp.xml has changed. So the, uh, the variable file and the template, those have both changed, and now we want to be able to commit those to the repository. So now the really fun stuff happens. So we're going to add just every single file that's changed because we're good. Uh, we're going to commit, and obviously we want to sign off because that's good discipline. And we'll just put a message in there that says added bgp network advertisement. Hit OK. Looks like the commit worked. We are now going to type in git review. Uh, and if you've never, if you're not familiar with this command, think of it basically like git push with a few other things attached to it. It's a, it's something specific to Garrett. Uh, it allows Garrett to review the code that you have uh, written, and it allows it with a simple command, git review. Uh, there's a git review file. If for those that do know about it, the git review file is actually included in the repo, so you'll have that too. So it looks like that worked. It pushed up. Now we can go to Garrett. Uh, if I can find it. And uh, unfortunately, um, I'm going to have to review this myself. No, normally, the person that would be doing this would not be the same person that uh, pushed the change. Uh, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like reviewing your own change and change management. Obviously, that kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, so, but because I'm only me, that's what we're stuck with. So this is the screen that you get for the change. And this is exactly what you would see if you were a software developer or a software project manager of some kind where you were approving code changes. You would actually see the difference here in the web interface. Uh, and this is not unique to Garrett. Most, most interfaces do this, GitHub, for instance. But it's very easy to see what's been added and what's been changed. So uh, that's all well and good. Let's go ahead and go back to this change, uh, the, the change window and take a look at what's happened in the meantime. So you, as you can see, Jenkins has actually commented on our patch already. It's letting us know that it ran a basic test, and that test name is that ci-networks-test-geo and that that test was successful. So let's take a look at what exactly that job does. If we look at configure, it's actually very, very simple. This job runs that build playbook. So the playbook that we ran in the command line before, we're running as a test. So let's say, you know, somebody forgot a step. You know, standard operating procedure says, please run any change you make, please run the build.yml file to, to at least verify that your template's built. 
So that's that's a great thing to to mandate. That's a great thing to tell your engineers to do because it shows it, it, it shows that they care enough to validate that their changes aren't just total gibberish. However, everybody's you know uh, uh, you know everybody's human, um, and I myself uh, have fallen prey to pushing things before I run some sort of build, uh, source code included. So what we want to do is we want to automate that process, and we don't want to allow code in that doesn't build. For example, this particular change, uh, it built the template that we created based off of all the YAML files, not just what's changed. It actually built everything in the directory uh, on the Jenkins side. And it let us know that that was successful. But let's simulate uh, something that's not successful to see exactly what would happen in, in terms of catching our error. Let's say, oh, I don't know. Let's just fat finger this particular variable here instead of group list. Let's just call it group list. Uh, and let's go ahead and go back to this command line, git status. Uh, we're going to add this file. And uh, if you're familiar with git, this will make sense. I'm basically going to amend my last commit. So I'm not making another commit. I'm just tacking on a different change, um, signing off, and then I'm taking the amend flag. So it goes back and it makes the same, it basically merges the same change that I just made onto the last commit, making it all one commit. Typing in git review again, submits that amend up to Garrett. Garrett recognizes it as not a new change. It recognizes it as a second patch set. So I don't need to have a different change review for this. All I need is to, is to see that there's another patch set. Jenkins actually sees the same thing. So if we review this, or refresh this, we can see that Jenkins has already run the second test, and that that test failed because it tried to run the build.yml playbook, and it gave this change a negative one as a result. So imagine, if you will, the project manager or, or, or the technical lead or whatever you want to call it logging into this interface saying, oh, looks like uh, Jenkins uh, failed the test for, for this. It looks like you made, a, you made a typo. They can even drill in to the files and look for themselves and, and, and speculate as to what it might be. And if they're, if they're, uh, you know, if they're uh, diligent enough, they can see that there's a typo there. They can comment, for instance, say, this is a typo. Please resubmit, as an example. So then the uh, software developer, uh, or rather the, the network administrator, can go back and make the change. But if you notice, it didn't go any further than that. So nothing that we just ran actually was pushed to any routers. This is all before that. So this is a great way to do some basic sanity checking. And of course, you're only as good as the, as the jobs that you can configure, so nothing's perfect. But it's better than what we have now, which is which is really nothing. <laughs> which is really, I'm going to make a change. Do do you approve or not? Yes or no. Um, in network infrastructure, we, you know, we get away with that uh, more than I care to admit. And this is definitely a step in the right direction. So we're going to remedy that change, doing one more amend. With any luck, our uh, the third patch set will build in Jenkins successfully, and we'll be able to move on to the next part. Any questions while I do that? You know, I've been monitoring, uh, you know, the question panel and and Twitter, and I'm I'm not seeing any. Um, okay. I, for one, a, a lot of this seems very familiar to me because I've been lo looking a lot more at the whole Jenkins and pipelines and continuous yeah. integration and all that. So it it seems very familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's the beauty of it, right? Like, this is not a kludge. This is not something that, you know, I just managed to get working. There's actually, there's some power here. Um, you know, you can, you can say that these tools are intended for software development, and as a software developer, I can definitely uh, vouch for that. But, but frankly, um, there, there is a lot of applicability uh, for, those, for, for those that know zero code. Um, zero code. It, it does not take a lot uh, to, to learn basic familiarity with these systems. Um, so there's a lot of power here. I agree with that. I know for one like Jenkins, that doesn't take a lot. There's not a huge um, gap there. You just got to get in, mess with it, play with the tool mm -hmm. a little bit. It's very easy to get an idea how to use Jenkins. Sure, sure. Uh, where was I? Oh, here. So we've committed, we've, we've fixed the change. Uh, looks like our test, or actually, so um, what I should have done is actually showed you Jenkins during the failure, uh, but the, uh, I'll just show you before, it re before I refresh. This is what it, uh, it's, it's letting us know that it failed the last build. Um, I believe, because I'm pretty confident, 
that the third build actually succeeded, and it did. So we can refresh Jenkins now, and it should say success. Okay, good. So everything's good. We like blue balls. We don't like red balls. Um, so now we're at the point uh, where a typical project lead or technical lead, senior developer, senior network engineer, whatever you want to call it, can go in and say, I think this can get pushed to production. I've looked at the code myself, or rather the configuration artifacts, the YAML files, the XML files. I've looked at these files. I believe they're good. And, and Jenkins has run its basic tests and succeeded. And because we've all come to an agreement on what tests should be run, those have succeeded. I think this is production worthy. We're already way, way ahead of the current process. Because what we've done is we've guaranteed at least what we've tested for, at least what Jen has been built into Jenkins. So the process for this is pretty simple. Plus one is sort of just an opinion. So Jenkins can't push code or push configuration artifacts into master. It can't actually merge these with the project and push them into production. But it can give an opinion. That's what a plus one is. A plus one or a negative one is just an opinion. It's saying, I like this or I don't like this. Um, plus two is reserved for those that can actually push what's been changed into production. So plus two means it's ready to be merged, and it provides this submit button. So now we can click submit. And now it's actually part of the Git repository. As you can see, that's the last thing that's been said here. What that means is prior to me hitting that submit button, if somebody else were to do a pull on this project, they actually wouldn't have gotten any of these changes. Um, only until I hit submit would they have gotten those, because it wasn't part of the code base before then. If we go over to Jenkins, you'll see that the CI Network's run geo job has kicked off. And this job is actually a lot more complicated, well, not a lot more, but significantly more complicated than our test job. Because in addition to running a playbook, this has to do a lot of uh, testing to verify that the change went through correctly. And this is just like, this is just like what we have in you know, typical software development pipelines. We want to make basic tests like running a Maven build, for instance, uh, with all of the various plugins, just to do some basic checking of, of whether or not the code is well formed. Uh, and, in our, and in our case, we want to run those tests against the actual network infrastructure to make sure certain things uh, are applied. So it looks like that passed. Let's actually open this job. Uh, if you're familiar with Jenkins, one of the coolest things that you can do is actually go into the build history. You can see the last job that ran was this one, reflecting this Garrett change, 60 patch set 3. Click on this particular build. We can click on the console output that actually was generated as part of this uh, Ansible run. So you can see the, the fact gathering kicked off. We got our versions. We got our serial numbers. That's all nice debug information to have in case you need it. Uh, all of these various uh, template building things, those are that's nothing new. Uh, we, we saw that in the build run. Uh, the Really, the only thing that's different is these config merges. Uh, and as you can see, we didn't change anything on VSRX01 or 02, but we did change something on VSRX03, and that's letting us know that something actually did change. So that's pretty useful. Now, we don't have any sort of way to automate the check. We want to be able to check in an automated fashion if that route was advertised successfully. It's one thing to verify that, you know, through Ansible that a change has been made, but that's not enough, not, not with network infrastructure. With network infrastructure, we need to know that a network is being advertised correctly. Um, before we get into how to automate that, let's check manually, because this is what we do today. And I kind of lost myself. Sorry about that. Uh, VSRX01. So we're in VSRX01. If we simply do a show route terse, and again, I'm not making any configuration changes. I'm just showing the details here. Uh, it looks like the route did not make it. So that's good, because that allows us to troubleshoot. So let's get into VSRX03 and see what applied. All right, fat fingered that. OK. Show configuration. Let's see what's missing. I usually leave a small snippet out. It's not uncommon. Uh, oh, yes. So it looks like the policy option. So uh, the big block of text that I mentioned, looks like that made it in. But uh, the policy BGP network is not being referred to for some reason uh, through that. So let's figure out why that happened. Uh, if we go back to uh, routerbgp.xml, this is exactly what's been pushed. And it's not in that either. Uh, so that's something that we should, probably should have caught. And again, you know, like I said, there's so many things you can do with this. Uh, my preference would be to build in some sort of logic on the test job that verifies uh, that basic things are found in the template that you're generating. And that can be done in a number of ways. Um, so I would like to make a change to the YAML file. Uh, and it looks, or rather the template. That's what I want to do. 
uh, if neighbor.export is defined, ah, that's why I got ahead of myself. Let's do BGP. Uh, let's do BGP. Advertise. BGP. Advertise. Okay, so so I I, I mixed up my uh, key value pairs there. So let's go ahead and fortunately we can we can check for this before we actually push again by running the build. Uh, oops. What did I do now? BGP.advertise. Uh, if name. Oh. <laughs> Neighbor.address. I actually want to do down here. Okay. So now if we go to the template, or rather the configuration, okay, now we have our export status. So we should be good now. Let's do a git add all, git commit, message, oops, forgot something. <laughs> uh, and I have done this uh, more times than I care to admit. Pushing that up, and we'll just quickly go through the process here so that we can get on with it. Change 61, oops, forgot something. We'll give Jenkins a second to uh, make the basic test. It should succeed because it succeeded on our end. Yes, success. Code review plus two, submit. If we go back to Jenkins, we should see that run geo job kick off. Uh, there's a very good reason uh, why this particular job takes a while. It actually has nothing to do with um, the the latency or anything like that between me and the routers. It's actually a sleep timer, <laughs> uh, and I'll, it, w that's the next interesting part that I'll get into. Okay, so that's finished. Networks run. Looks like it ran successfully. So let's go one more time. Over to uh, let's try VSRX01 again, simply typing up, and there we go. We finally have the network that we want advertised. Uh, wouldn't be a live demo without a small hiccup, would it? So we've got our change. We're advertising the network, and therefore we have the first objective here uh, satisfied. Um, we won't. I won't go through the third one because I, I think we're running out of time. Uh, but the second one, this middle one, is is extremely important. So I'd like to touch on that, and actually, it doesn't take long at all. So what I'd like to do is, is go a little deeper into Jenkins, uh, the job for actually deploying this, these changes into our network devices. Let's go to configure. And at the very bottom, and, uh, and, and again, this is, this is part of what Tyler Christensen has been doing. He's, he's gone, he, because of his familiarity with, with uh, Junos, he's gone way beyond what I can do with these, uh, with these Python with, or with the, with the testing. Uh, highly recommend you check out his stuff because there's a ton of nerd knobs that you, can, that you can do that I'm only scratching the surface of. So what I've done is I've combined his work with uh, a little bit of unit testing, which if, you, if you've done any software development or, frankly, any um, you know, continuous integration of any kind, uh, you are probably familiar with that term. So what I'm doing is I'm applying the concept of unit testing or test-driven development to networking in this way. I'm saying I want to run this test script, this Python script here, and based on the output, I want you to fail or not fail the job. So if you see the word fail in the output, then the whole Jenkins job fails, meaning this test script better run successfully, and if it doesn't, the whole thing fails. So that begs the question, what is in the, the Python script? That's a very good question. And the answer to that question is in this directory, tests, test.py. Test.py is very simple. It uses uh, two things. First, uh, the PyEZ libraries from Juniper that allow you to interact with JunoS uh, or Junos uh, programmatically with Python. It also uses the, the unit test library. So this is something that, that software developers use to run through functions of their code and make certain assumptions. So if a, if a certain function adds two numbers together, uh, you can call that function and say, I assume that after I run this function and I use the arguments 2 and 2, that the result is 4. Pretty straightforward. Well, our example is actually not that much different. What we want to do is test to ensure that after checking for the presence of a route, namely this one, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 
we see that. <laughs> we actually want to see, we want to make sure that we see at least one route from this query. Because if we don't see it, then it's zero. So at the moment, I have this Python script. It's running every single job. And if you remember from uh, the Jenkins uh, run, and I went out of that, uh, if we go to configure, you'll see that I'm running the script. I'm also sleeping for 20 seconds. That's why it takes so long to, to do this. The reason for that is BGP can be kind of slow, so I don't want to kick this script off prematurely. I'd like the script to run after there's a chance uh, that the network has reconverged around our change. So what I want to do is I want to comment this out because this basically uh, verifies, this, this, obviously one will always equal one, so that's sort of meaningless. It passes it regardless. This is the, the line that we want. What we want to do is we want to make sure that the result of this variable here, uh, it's actually, a, I believe, a list. Yeah, it should be a list. I want to verify that, that there is at least one entry in that resulting list because if that route doesn't exist, it'll be equal to zero. This will fail. The whole thing will fail, and then the Jenkins job will fail. So by doing this, we're actually adding a pretty big layer of protection to our changes. Now, I'm not going to do this in this demo, um, but, but one of the cool things about Junos is that you can roll back changes. So based off of the output of this script, you could actually say, oh, it looks like I don't see the network um, after a, DC, you know, a, a sufficient amount of time. I'm actually going to roll back the change because something went wrong. That's absolutely something that you can do as part of this workflow. So now that I made that change, again, that script is in the repository. So just like any other configuration artifact, we want to publish that through Git because even the changes to the tests need to be reviewed just like source code. So we're going to add that file. We're going to say git commit added basic unit test for route presence. Git review. And now we go back to Garrett. Garrett should show our change, number 62. Needs code review, needs a bunch of things actually. Keep refreshing. Nothing's been changed to the templates or anything like that, so obviously Jenkins should have no problem with passing the basic test. Again, it's very important for somebody that's knowledgeable on the subject matter to look at this. Looks like we commented this out and looks like we uncommented this. That's what's changed. Okay, I as a human being, uh, on top of the automated testing, verify that this is legit. So I'm gonna submit it. So now it's part of the code base and again, it's going to kick that same job off. So what's going to happen here, since we haven't changed anything but the testing, Ansible will still run, but Ansible is item potent. So Ansible actually won't make any changes. It's just going to see that what, what is, again, those two, those two terms, what it, what it should be and what it really is, it's going to see that those two ideas are the same, and it doesn't need to do anything, so it's going to say nothing has changed. Um, at the very, I mean, at, at, on the device level, the template directory is rebuilt every single time, so that will have changed. So the only thing that's changed here is that the Python script verifies the presence of a route. Looks like it passed. And one last thing, we can actually see the output of the script says success. All tests completed successfully, which means that the entire job completed and we now expect that uh, our changes are in production safely. So our routes there. That's cool. So you built on the error checking, essentially, which that's that's very important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this you'd be surprised. Um, and this is a very simple example. Uh, you can get, obviously, because everything's just defined in Python, you can write something very, very elaborate. Um, I can't tell you how many times I personally have been, bit, been bitten by changes that are made on a weekend. Um, and, you know, on a weekend, networks don't really sustain a lot of load, depending on the business, of course. Um, you know, it's very it's very common for changes that happen on the weekend. Don't get this, if if there's a problem in that change, it's very common for for those problems not to be even discovered uh, at all until Monday, way after the change window and way after the engineers have gone home. So one of the thing one of the reasons for this is it provides um, documented test cases, just like with source code, that allows the engineers to know not just assume but know that their changes went through successfully and that they're not going to get a huge angry phone call at you know, 7 a.m. on Monday. Yep, so it's really about not only automating it, but building in checks and balances along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is, you're going to fall flat on your face if you try to do this, and you know, the next day you bring the network down. I guarantee you. You need to have the buy-in. And again, I have to reiterate, the two things that you really need to focus on for this is not the technical. It's actually cultural, so you need to make sure that you have buy-in. You need to have a, 
you know, a good discussion with your, your fellow teammates and, and have them understand why you're trying to do this. Uh, and you also need to have good discipline, right? This is not about, you know, this, the continuous integration doesn't just mean, you know, do things faster. Um, it's do things faster because we can, because we have confidence that we can do so safely without, you know, ruining the velocity of the project. Same thing applies to network infrastructure. Absolutely. Uh, we did have a question come up. It's pretty generalized. Um, somebody okay. was asking, basically, have you, have you seen anybody doing this with, like, Cisco IOS? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I will just give a little background. I'm traditionally I've been more of a Cisco guy. I did a lot of Cisco consulting. I don't do that. You know, I don't do the same the same uh, role anymore. So not as much nowadays. But uh, yes, it's possible. Um, there's actually a lot of work that's going on. Uh, you know, Juno S has a lot of the features that make this really easy built in. Uh, iOS or even NXOS don't really have those features, but it's possible. Um, anything's possible with a little bit of know-how. In fact, I'd like to call out uh, Kirk Byers. Uh, he's another guy, a very knowledgeable Python guy. He does, a, he does an online class. Highly recommend it. Um, but he's, uh, his, his, his focus is you know, educating network engineers about automation and, and, and Python. Um, so he's, he's you know, leading that charge. Um, and he, he's actually working on a lot of uh, cool stuff uh, around automating network devices that don't necessarily have an API like JunoS does. Cisco IOS is pretty much you're limited to SNMP and CLI, um, and those are tools. You know, just like you know, they may not be as I guess sexy as you know a, a NetConf API or a REST API, uh, but they're there. Um, so to answer the question, yes, it's possible. It's probably not as straightforward. They're probably you know, it's it, the the on ramp is probably a little further, but yes, it is it is possible. Yeah, because I can imagine with a solution like that, if you don't got the REST APIs or something, it's more like having to script it out and run you know have it run into an SSH. SSH session, a lot more involved. Yeah, well, the, the difficulty around API versus like a CLI is that human beings are a lot more forgiving uh, when there's a change. Uh, APIs are versioned for a reason. CLIs typically aren't, aren't versioned. Um, they change uh, and they're documented in, in like a PDF, but, you know, human beings, the, the, you know, computers are not intuitive, at least not yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's a great example. So it's possible. It just requires a little bit more uh, software hackery, if you will. Makes sense. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more slide, and that's really just informational. Um, uh, I'm going to publish. I, I was talking with uh, with John prior to the to the, um, the the go to meeting, but basically, I'll publish all of these to the blog post that follows this. Uh, in short, I'm going to put up. It's not up there yet. I unfortunately, in, in the middle of this demo, realized that I forgot to upload it. So check tomorrow. <laughs> um, that that GitHub URL will actually resolve to something um, tomorrow. The, uh, the original VSRX demo, I actually can't claim credit for most of what I just showed you. Um, Jeremy Schulman did a ton of work uh, getting uh, a lot of this uh, up and running when he worked at Juniper. He's now, uh, he's now uh, got his own company, Sprockets. Highly recommend you check him out. Um, blogs, uh, Tyler Christensen, the gentleman that I uh, spoke of earlier, I uh, definitely recommend looking at his stuff. His blog is there. Uh, my blog has a decent amount of uh, information on this topic as well, keeping it classless.net. And uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime at Mirden. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Um, definitely love having these kind of conversations, so don't feel shy. Absolutely. And um, I'll just kind of throw it out there. If anybody's out there and has any additional questions for Matt, go ahead and get them into the uh, the question window or on the, uh, the Twitter uh, hashtag, and we'll get them answered. If not, um, we'll go ahead and uh, end this session for today. And Matt, thanks again for uh, coming on and Talking about this, I mean, it's a very exciting time to be in IT, to tell you the truth. Absolutely. There's just so many changes going on with 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 the way we are, uh, you know, delivering IT services, right, uh, to the end users in the business. So it's a, it's sure. a very interesting time to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no excuse for being bored. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so with that being said, it looks like I'm not getting any more um, – any more questions coming through? So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.